Hi, welcome to chapter eight. We're gonna talk about photosynthesis and you're gonna see a lot of similarities between chapter seven, cellular respiration, and this chapter. A basic definition of photosynthesis is converting solar energy into chemical energy. Plants take sunlight and they turn it into chemical energy in the bonds of carbohydrates. Plants are autotrophs, and we list others, algae, cyanobacteria. Basically, they make their own food. So they're capable of both cellular respiration, taking glucose and turning it into ATP, and then they're capable of photosynthesis, where they take sunlight and turn it into a carbohydrate or a glucose. So plants, algae, cyanobacteria are autotrophs. We are heterotrophs. So we feed on other organisms. If we look at the uh, general equation here for photosynthesis, we can see that carbon dioxide and water with the help of solar energy is transformed into glucose and oxygen. So if you looked at the cellular respiration or remember cellular respiration equation, it's basically just the opposite way, right? In cellular respiration, we take glucose and oxygen and we turn it into water, CO2, and ATP. So photosynthesis is just the opposite of that. Carbon dioxide, water, solar energy uh, produces carbohydrates and oxygen. Let's look at a leaf structure before we move into the process of photosynthesis. So you can see there are different layers, but basically we're looking at a plant cell. And these green little spots, these are chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are the organelles in which photosynthesis takes place. We also know that we have to exchange carbon dioxide and oxygen. So plants use carbon dioxide and they release oxygen during the process of photosynthesis. So we have to pay attention to these openings, which are called stomata. That's the way for the plant to release these gases. Here we have the chloroplast. This is a double uh, membrane organelle responsible or the site of photosynthesis. We can see some of these terms. Granum is a stack. Grana is multiple stacks, and these um, membranes are called thylakoid membranes. This should look really familiar to you, just like we have the infoldings of the mitochondria, the cristae. We have infoldings of the inner membrane of the chloroplast, and it's called the thylakoid membrane. In photosynthesis, we have two sets of reactions. So the first reaction is the light reaction. This is light dependent. You have to have sunlight for this reaction to occur. And then the second reaction set is called the Calvin reaction, and this is light independent. We're also going to see a similar um, NAD coenzyme, except for this one is NADP, so it has a phosphate attached to it. Nice list here of what's happening and what are the um, inputs and outputs. So the light reaction requires solar energy and water. That's why it required, that's why it's called the light reaction or light dependent. And it produces oxygen, ATP, and NADPH. The Calvin cycle requires ATP, NADPH, and CO2, and it's gonna produce your carbohydrates. This is a nice visual representation of the set of reactions happening in the chloroplast. I'm gonna draw just a division line here. So if we look at the first set of reactions, the light reactions, we have solar energy and water, along with ADP and NADP plus. All of that goes in and what comes out? So these are the inputs and what are the outputs? The outputs of the light reaction are oxygen, NADPH and ATP. Then we have the second reaction. This is the Calvin cycle. This is the light independent reactions. What do we need to put in? We need to put in CO2. We need to put in NADPH. We need to put in ATP. And those get processed through the Calvin cycle. And what comes out? Carbohydrates. Before we talk about the process in more detail, I just want to make sure when I'm talking about visible light that we understand that there are different wavelengths of light and they correspond to different colors. And this becomes important in the next slide. 
Here we have listed the three pigments, and these pigments are in the chloroplast, specifically the thylakoid membrane, and these pigments basically absorb visible light at certain wavelengths. So basically if I took chlorophyll A and I shaded everything under chlorophyll A, you can see that chlorophyll A absorbs light in this range and this range. So this red-orange kind of color and this blue-purple. Uh, then we have chlorophyll B. Chlorophyll B does all of this range, so basically everything from here over, and then chlorophyll B does a little bit over here in kind of the orange-yellow range. Then we finally get to the carotenoid, and that covers, again, the purple-blue range, and that brings us to about here. So what I want you to notice is where is there no light being absorbed? Abbreviate. So this range right here, there's very little to no light being absorbed by the plants. It's almost like they can't use the light that's in the green spectrum. If they can't use it, they reflect it back. This is why plants are green. Of course, things can't be easy. So here's the first set of reactions, the light reactions. This is happening in the thylakoid membrane, but there are two pathways. We're going to look at non-cyclical and cyclical pathways. This is the most, we're going to say normal, right? Both pathways take solar energy and turn it into chemical energy. They're just a little bit different in their processes. Both produce ATP, but only the non-cyclic produces NADPH. And remember, this is necessary for the Calvin cycle. In this image, we're talking about the non-cyclical pathway. So we're still talking about the first set of reactions, the light reactions, but we're talking about the first pathway, which is non-cyclic. So here we can see water. Remember, water is a requirement to start the light reaction. We also have to have solar energy. So water is gonna be split at photosystem two. The oxygen, is released as waste and we have a few hydrogen protons generated. What happens to the electron? The electron enters the photosystem and this electron is bouncing around and if the electron gains enough energy it's gonna move up to this electron acceptor. What's causing the electron to move around? What's exciting the electron? Sunlight. So the electron is split from water, it goes into the photosystem two, and that's where we have the pigments. We just saw those pigments, chlorophyll A, B, and carotenoid. So that electron bounces around in the photosystem because the sun is exciting the electron. When it reaches an excited state, it comes up here to this electron acceptor. The electron is gonna move through the electron transport chain and it's going to generate ATP during this process. I'm going to show you another image in just a second that will help explain this a little bit more. So ATP is generated. That's this right here. We got our ATP. And then the electron comes over here to photosystem 1. Again, we have those complexes, the chlorophyll A, B, carotenoid. And the electron has sun shining on it again, and that electron gets excited, and it reaches this electron acceptor. Now the electrons are going to combine with NADP plus and hydrogen ions that we got over here when we split our water, and it's going to form NADPH. So now we've got our NADPH, which is an output of the light reaction. Here we have an enlargement of the thylakoid membrane. So we're still talking about the light reactions. We're specifically going to look at photosystem two, photosystem one, and the electron transport chain. So this is kind of just a more realistic version of the slide that we just looked at. So now we're looking at the thylakoid membrane here and here. 
we can see the water is split into hydrogens and oxygen. The electron is put into photosystem two. That electron becomes excited because of the sunlight and the electron moves through the electron transport chain and hydrogens are pumped from the outside of the thylakoid membrane to the inside. As the electron moves, it reaches photosystem one. Again, sunlight excites that electron. And then eventually the electrons join with the hydrogens from the splitting of water and form NADPH. You can see over here, NADP reductase. So there's an enzyme responsible for taking those electrons and that hydrogen and the NADP plus and creating NADPH. Now we have all these hydrogens inside, right? We split water and we have hydrogens. Also, as the electron flows through the electron transport chain, we have hydrogens being pushed to the inside. This high hydrogen ion concentration gradient is going to cause the generation of ATP. What happens to the hydrogens? They flow through, and we saw this already, it's an ATP synthase. As the hydrogen ions flow through the ATP synthase, it generates enough energy to take ADP and P and turn it into ATP. Same word, chemiosmosis. So we've seen this process before. Remember, chemiosmosis is the generation of ATP from a, a hydrogen ion concentration gradient. The cyclic electron pathway is just another pathway. We're still talking about the light reactions. And what happens is the electron get, becomes excited, gets to this acceptor state because the sun is exciting the electron. It moves through the electron transport chain, but the electron comes right back to photosystem one. So remember in the non-cyclic, the electrons and the hydrogens eventually formed NADPH. Well, in the cyclic pathway, there is no NADPH formed. All that's being made in the cyclic is ATP, and that can be used to enter the Calvin cycle and create carbohydrates. This is just a variation. Plants can do both non-cyclic and cyclic, um, basically just to boost ATP production if they need it. We can also see this uh, varied pathway when we look at evolution. There are some bacterial cells that can do just the cyclic electron pathway. And if you remember, and bacteria are prokaryotes, so they do not have chloroplasts. So just some variation there, but plants can do both cyclic and non-cyclic. Now we move into the Calvin cycle. So this is the second reaction set, and the Calvin cycle has three steps. So there's carbon dioxide fixation, carbon dioxide reduction, and the regeneration of this starting molecule, which is called RUBP. Here we have the Calvin cycle broken up into fixation, reduction, and regeneration. We know the inputs for the Calvin cycle are carbon dioxide, NADPH, and ATP. Here's our starting molecule. It's RUBP. RUBP is a five carbon structure, and we're going to add a one carbon structure, carbon dioxide. I know there's threes in front of everything. They're showing you that this has to turn multiple times. We have three turns to make one G3P, and that is a three carbon. So I have to put three carbon dioxides in to get one three carbon molecule. So one carbon from carbon dioxide and your five carbon RUBP. So if I put five and one together, I now have a six carbon structure. I've fixed my carbon dioxide. Now we have to do the reduction, right? So we're going to add energy. We're gonna add electrons, add hydrogens, and we're gonna modify this molecule. Eventually, we end up with a three carbon G3P. Here they're telling you there are six three carbons. Only one of them is gonna be kicked out of the system 
and that's one three carbon G3P. So what happens to the other five three carbon structures? We have to regenerate them back into a five carbon structure. So we add energy, we modify this molecule, and we end up with three five carbons. So we have our starting material back again so that the next carbon dioxides can go in and be processed. So let me do that one more time. CO2 plus NADPH plus ATP are all the inputs for the Calvin cycle. What's the output? Glucose. We have a five carbon and we add a one carbon carbon dioxide. We end up with a six carbon structure. We have fixed the carbon dioxide. This six carbon structure is going to break down. We're going to add some energy. We're going to add some electrons. We're going to add some hydrogens. And what comes off, what comes out of the Calvin cycle? It is one molecule of G3P, which is a three carbon. So you only get one three carbon molecule from this Calvin cycle. Then we have this leftover material that we need to regenerate into our UBP. We have, this was our starting molecule, right? So we got to get back to that so that the next carbon dioxide can bind. So we add energy and we manipulate this molecule and regenerate it back into our UBP. So three turns gives us one three carbon G3P, and I have to take two G3Ps to equal one glucose. So we have to do six turns of the Calvin cycle to make one glucose molecule. Just to briefly mention that that G3P can be used to produce lots of different molecules. So yes, it can make glucose. We could also make uh, sucrose, starches, cellulose, fatty acids, glycerol to make plant oils, and amino acid synthesis. So this is kind of the backbone that the plant can use to make a variety of structures. Many of the plants that we know carry out C3 photosynthesis. So if you want to call this kind of the normal, that's fine for us. The only problem with C3 is that it's not really efficient if it's really hot and dry. So some plants have made modifications to photosynthesis to make it more um, efficient for their environment. Here's our normal kind of C3 where we have CO2 coming in and it enters the Calvin cycle. The only problem is that the oxygen that was created from the split of water in the non-cyclic pathway, that oxygen can bind this RUBP and it makes the production of G3P not very efficient, especially if it's a hot, warm climate. So this is the normal process, but if it's a hot, warm climate, some adaptations might serve you better. C4 photosynthesis is a modification that some plants have for kind of hotter, warmer climates. You can see a C3 plant, the, kind of the orientation of the mesophyll cells versus the bundle sheath cells, and the bundle sheath is where the Calvin cycle occurs. And you can see in this instance for C4s, here's the stomata. So that's where the CO2 comes into the plant leaf and it's stored in these cells. These are mesophyll cells. So basically we're storing the CO2 and that stops that inefficient G3P production. So the, when necessary, the CO2 will be released into the bundle sheath cell and it'll enter the Calvin cycle and you can get a higher yield of G3P due to this system. The other type of photosynthesis is called CAM photosynthesis. This is in areas where you have a hot, uh, dry climate where you want your stomata to be closed during the day. So this is more of a time of day rather than sequestering the CO2 into a separate cell like we saw with C4s. So basically the stomata, 
stomata are closed during the day and then they're open at night and CO2 is brought into the cell and the Calvin cycle occurs. Remember over here we had our non-cyclic that's going to happen during the day because we need sunlight, right? Non-cyclic pathway is light dependent. We're going to generate that NADPH and ATP. Remember, we also had oxygen left over from when we split the water to excite the electron. Well, that oxygen can be released because the stomata are now open at nighttime, so you don't get the oxygen interference with that RUVP molecule. So that doesn't happen. So then you have a normal production of G3P. Now we get to look at photosynthesis versus cellular respiration. So both plants and animals can carry out cellular respiration. Remember both plant and animal cells have mitochondria. They break down glucose, they produce ATP energy. So plants can use glucose to make energy so that they can grow. We consume glucose so that we can make energy for body movement muscle contraction, neuron transmission. Plant cells do photosynthesis. Animal cells do not. Photosynthesis occurs in the chloroplast. It basically builds glucose from carbon dioxide and it requires sunlight or solar energy. So here's a nice way to draw the equations for both photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So if you're doing photosynthesis, you're driving the equation this way. If you're doing cellular respiration, you're driving the equation the opposite way. So you see that they are the reverse of each other. The only difference is the energy here, it's either ATP if we're talking about cellular respiration, or it's solar energy if we're talking about photosynthesis. Remember, both have an electron transport chain. So cellular respiration, electron transport chain, here in the light reaction, electron transport chain, and they both create ATP by chemiosmosis. I'm going to abbreviate. So remember in both of these we saw the hydrogen ions flowing through the ATP synthase generating enough energy to combine ADP plus P and the energy to form ATP. I would go through this comparison and see if you can kind of walk yourself through it. Can you talk about everything that's happening? Can you talk about the inputs and the outputs? And I would think of them overall for the entire process and for the individual um, reactions. So what do I mean? What's the overall for photosynthesis? Overall photosynthesis reaction, solar energy, water, and CO2 are the inputs. What are the outputs? Oxygen carbohydrate of some sort. But if I said break it down by reaction, what's the input just for the light reaction? Input for the light reaction is solar energy and water. What is the output for the light reaction? NADPH, ATP, and oxygen. Do the same thing for the Calvin cycle. If I said just specifically the Calvin cycle, what is the input? CO2, NADPH, ATP are the inputs, and what's the output? Carbohydrate. So again, overall, what are the inputs and the outputs for cellular respiration? And then do inputs and outputs for each of these four steps. If you can do that, you are prepared for this exam. I'll talk to you next lecture. Bye.